When you feel you want the taste of something intriguing and delicious, taste Amaretto di Saru. Other eyes are on its own. Intriguing, fascinating, delicious. The original Amaretto di Saru. Warner Home Video with Parkfield Entertainment bring you Lethal Weapon. Heartbreak Ridge. Why don't you just sit there and bleed a while before you taste some real pain. Blade Runner. Highlander. You cannot die, McLeod. And the Lost Boys. Stay back! Stay back! you're a stranger. Yours for only $9.99. Fast forward to your video store now. Late Night Late for a Tuesday morning. Good morning. My guest is Fiona pitt Kathleen. Welcome to Late Night Late. You're not usually up in the middle of the night, are you? Uh, not watching telly, no. Right, well, fair enough, because probably you are writing poetry. Now, I have your latest anthology in front of me called The Perfect Man. Are you in search of the perfect man? I hate them when I find them. I much prefer imperfect ones. What sort of imperfections do you like in particular? I like a touch of humanity. You know, the person who could maybe get drunk once in a blue while or something. You know, just just a little bit of fallibility there. I mean, imperfect um, perfect men make me feel inferior. All right, now, one of the, well, there are two things that really come across in this book. One is the fact that you take men to task on attitudes, the way they see women. And the other thing is, is language. Would that be a fair assessment? Yes, I, I mean, I care strongly about equal rights. Uh, and also, I, I don't see why certain words in the language should be discriminated against. I'm all for using them occasionally. I mean, not necessarily all that often, but occasionally in their right place. All right, and this is probably a hypocrisy of us to bring you along here tonight and for me to say, don't use <laughs> that word. In fact, I haven't asked you not to use that word, but it sort of illustrates the dilemma. Um, there's actually a recent report, I don't know if you know about this, but uh, on television, most people don't mind sex and they don't mind violence, but they don't like to hear that word which brings us very neatly into one of the um, opening poems in The Perfect Man, which is all about that word. I bet you're glad your daughter wasn't here tonight to hear that word, I heard one man say to another man the night I read. His hair looked dyed, his face was red with rage, which made the bird tattoo flying down his neck seem extra blue. I rather wondered if he and his friend that worded their own daughters at weekends. Statistics prove lots of men do. A vicar's girl taught all the class that word when I was nine. I really took to it. So easy to remember and pronounce, and good for rhymes. It's not a synonym, an honest word that only means one thing. I've used it ever since. Beside all that, I rather like the short, sharp shock it gives to men with daughters to protect. Why do, why do you think men are so uptight about it? More so than women, perhaps? Well, I think particularly the middle-aged and old ones are a little old-fashioned about the thing. I mean, I think of men and women as very, very similar, really, with an equal potential in everything. All right. Now, you, you actually say that uh, there is a book to be written on the psychology of swearing. Do you think that you're going to be the person to write it? Well, I did an article on it once. I, I don't know that I could quite stretch it to a book. Oh, so you, you, oh, you have actually written about it before. Now, I think it'd be fair to say that you enjoy sex. Yes. Why, why, why do you think the rest of us have so many problems talking about it in the open? Maybe, maybe it's only the British. I think, I think they're probably grandier in attitude abroad. Uh, so some nationalities. So do you it? think by the time it comes around to 1992, when we have open markets, we're also going to have more open attitudes? Or do you think it's something that's actually ingrained in the British that sex is difficult? Well, I think if British men don't change very soon, they, they, they lose out to the competition. All right. Well, British men, um, a poem that may be quite pertinent to you. <laughs> the second one uh, in, in the book is actually called Big Pricks. So I will, I will leave you to read this mm -hmm. one. Yes. Last birthday, someone sent a glossy card. A headless torso graced the front side fold, solarium tanned and even reddish brown. Inside the centre bit, its droopy dong hung like a leathered rope on hairy thighs. A naked man can turn me on, I find. A well-developed chest, a tightish bum, long legs, a general harmony of form. 
I'm choosy though. He has to have a head. Big pricks are overrated bits of meat. Priapic worships more a game for men. They're big. They think they've won the pools at birth. I knew a theatre usher long ago who liked to boast that he could suck his own. Large cocks are good for narcissism, not sex. Their owners have this tendency to stand as if they're waiting for a prize at Crufts. What a big boy! Aren't I the lucky girl, we're meant to say. They're Ozymandias-like about their things. Right, now, what is the difficulty of actually reading out a poem like that? I, there will be some people at home now who will feel absolutely disgusted by you having read that. How, how do you feel towards them? I think they're being a bit old-fashioned and silly. I mean, I'm not actually doing any harm with a poem like that. I mean, words are not violence in themselves. But would your mother be proud of you if, if she heard you reading that? Yes, yes. Well, I think that's probably a first on Late Night Late. <laughs> now, something else that interests me about you, you've actually advertised for work, haven't you? You must be mm. one of the only poets that I think I've ever read about that, that put a, a, an advert in a paper and said, look, I'm available, use me. Why, why did you do that? Well, because I wasn't getting enough work, really. Very simple reason. Um, I, I don't see why one shouldn't. I mean, the literary establishment is terribly state. I mean, I don't get work judging competitions, for instance, so I've actually asked the Poetry Society if I can be a judge now, and I don't know whether they will let me or not. It's got to go before the board. You know, it's a very stiff old system. I mean, I also advertised for an agent and got a good one. So I think, I think adverts in anything, at, you know, work. I mean, they sell things, don't they? So, so why not sell yourself that way? Have you ever considered uh, a sideline, like perhaps writing for Mills and Boone? Uh, I don't think I've got the temperament. Um, I mean, their, their heroines are terribly characterless. Uh, I mean, I'd much rather be a hero in a book. You know, I see myself going out and doing things and, and, and sort of occasionally being the more powerful person in a relationship. I mean, I once read a poem about that. Is there, is there a particular generic tendency, then, of women in Mills and Boone? I, I think there seems to be. I mean, people swear they're getting better, but I'm not too sure about it. I mean, the men tend to be slightly sadistic and overpowering, and they're always much richer and older. Uh, I mean, I went to Electra on them once, and the heroines were 17 to 28, and the heroes were 30 to 45. You know, I mean, as a person who likes toy boys a bit, you see, I mean, I just wasn't interested in that. So, in, I mean, in essence, then, there's a real dishonesty about a romantic novel, isn't there? You, you actually deal with reality. Yes, yes, I'd much rather. Right. Well, on that note, that's where I have to say thank you very much for coming in and reading some of your poetry. The book is The Perfect Man. It is published by Abacus at a price of three ninety nine. I think it's available now, isn't it? Mm, yes. Right. Well, uh, at two o'clock, it's The Fool Guy. Right now, though, Sports World Extra.